Now I want to invite you to turn with me to the 25th Psalm this evening that we may consider its message in a particular direction and with a particular emphasis. I want to think with you this evening about the whole theme of seeking and discovering the will of God and that our thinking may be biblical. I want to consider the teaching of Psalm 25 with you, a major theme of which is the psalmist's plea for God's guidance. As you would notice in our reading in verse 4, for example, Make me to know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. The plea of the psalmist then is that he might be instructed and led in the ways of God. And that plea is joined with a conviction that God does guide his children into his perfect will, that he is not aloof and remote from his children's lives or needs or situation, but that he does lead them into his perfect ways. In verse 9, for example, the psalmist expresses the conviction, he leads the humble in what is right, or the authorized version, he guides the meek in judgment. And in verse 12, who is the man that fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. So the psalmist is, as it were, building on two keynotes. One is a plea that he might be led into the will of God and undergirding it is a conviction that God is the kind of God who gladly and willingly leads his people into his perfect will. Now I want us to learn the great lessons of this psalm concerning seeking and knowing the will of God for life or for some part or situation of life. I suppose largely because I'm deeply impressed by the number of people who are seeking the will of God in these days. A healthy sign, may I say, a healthy sign amongst us spiritually that there are many people who are exercised about such issues as what does God purpose that I should do with my life? What is the will and good purpose of God in this situation or this or this? I rejoice to discover people considering this issue and being burdened and concerned by it, it's a sign of spiritual health. But it is also an area of spiritual difficulty for many people. And it's an important thing for us to seek the counsel of God concerning this. I think it's interesting and significant to notice the circumstances in which the psalmist is living at this particular time. He is clearly, as the last few verses of the psalm make obvious, in a time of trouble and perplexity. He didn't know where to turn. He felt under great pressure from many directions, chiefly from enemies and foes that he was facing. And he feared lest he might take a wrong turning, quite obviously, at this crucial time. In his life. You get all of this in verses 16 to 21. Turn thou to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distresses. Consider my afflictions and my trouble and forgive all my sins. He is obviously wondering whether his past failures are going to affect his being led into the will of God in the future. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my life and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in thee. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. 
Now the psalmist is a godly man in the midst of this situation and he cries to God to lead and guide him. And in the process he tells us a great deal of some of the main biblical principles that we need to have if we are going to be as serious as he is about seeking the will of God, undergirding all our thinking and guiding our understanding of this whole theme. There are a number of areas in which I want us to focus this evening and they will come out in principles, I suppose you could call them if that is not too pretentious or lofty a title, principles by which we might seek to understand the will of God. And the first of them is this. There is a basic attitude which lies behind this appeal for guidance in the psalm and it is one of an absolute and exclusive trust in God, in his wisdom, his goodness, his faithfulness, his sovereign rule over all the affairs of his people. That's where the psalmist lays his foundation in verse 2, you notice. And he reaffirms it again in verse 20. Oh my God, he says, and this is the foundation of his life. In thee I trust, let me not be put to shame. And in verse 20, O oh God, my life and deliver me, let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in thee. Now what he is expressing there is not some casual comment. It is the very foundation of the man's life. He is a man who in every area of life and at every age of his life, he is trusting in the Lord. That's the key to his life. It's that that makes him the kind of man he is. He is a man who trusts in the Lord. And what he is saying is that come what may, happen what will, the very foundation on which his life is built is that he trusts in the Lord. Now if you examine the psalm a little more closely, you will discover that what the psalmist is really saying is that there are elements in the character of God that he has come to know. There are glories in the Godhead that have been revealed to him, which have begotten in him a spirit of trust and confidence which enable him to make the Lord his refuge. That's what the psalmist is saying. And this is the link with the theme that we were studying this morning of knowing God. And you constantly come back to this. It's not by accident that we do so this evening. You constantly come back to it. Every area of a Christian man's life relates to this basic issue of the level at which he has come to know God. Because it is knowing God, you see, that enables a man to trust him. Now look at this. He says, I am perplexed and in trouble, but the basic quality of my life is this. Unto thee, O Lord, at the beginning of the psalm, I lift up my soul. O my God, in thee I trust. For thee I wait all the day long. Now, what is he saying when he says that it is in God he has put his trust? Well, throughout the psalm, he begins to rehearse all sorts of different elements in God's character. He is a man, you see, who has come to know God. And this is the vital thing. Verse 5, for example. He has come to know something of God's saving power. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. He has come to know something of his tender mercy and steadfast love. Verse 6, be mindful of thy mercy, O Lord, and of thy steadfast love, for they have been from of old. He has come to know something of God's goodness and justice in verse 7. According to thy steadfast love, remember me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. And then in verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant. Now you see the important thing is this, 
It's only when a man has come to know God like this that he is ready to trust himself to him. That's something that you see in the human sphere, is it not? You never trust a man unless you really know him. That's why people regularly send me. You may be surprised that they send it to me, but they send to me letters saying, I am thinking of employing so-and-so. Can I really trust him? And they wait until they get a letter back. And I presume that when I send the letter back, they say, Ah, oh, well, now, if he says it's all right, we will be able to trust him. When we get to know people better, you know, if you have found that somebody agrees to meet you at three o'clock in the afternoon and they turn up at ten to four regularly, you begin to say, well, I am not very confident that I can trust that man. He is not the kind of person that I can put my confidence in. But if you have found him to be the kind of man who does precisely what he says, who always keeps his word, who is true to his character, then you say, well, I will put my trust in him. He is the kind of man you can have confidence in. And it's precisely this multiplied by infinity that the psalmist sees in the character of God. He has come to know God and therefore he is enabled to trust him. Now do you see, my dear friends, the significance of our studying the word of God faithfully and regularly and deeply so that we may come to know God because it's a vital element in guidance. You see, you can't isolate this question of guidance as we often do and say, oh yes, now here are the five laws of guidance, A, B, C, D, E. And you can apply these and you will find guidance all right. You can't do that. It doesn't work like that. You need to be the kind of man or woman who knows God and is increasing in the knowledge of God before you will be ready to trust him. And it's the man who says, I have put my trust in thee, who is going to know God's leading in his life. It's this, is it not, basically, that makes us often a little bit apprehensive about the will of God. Sometimes what some of us need is not guidance about the will of God, but assurance about the character of God. Because, you know, we are rather tentative about seeking God's will in an open, glad, willing way. And we wonder, as somebody actually said to me not so very long ago, I don't want to be too open with God in case he takes advantage of me. Now that was a very honest statement of something that lies deep down in the hearts of many people. What if he sends me to Africa? What if he doesn't send me here? Or what if he does this with my life? But you see what such a man is needing as he faces the will of God is not guidance about God's will, it's assurance about God's character. That there may be born in him the spirit that says, I have put my trust in thee, all the ways of the Lord are perfect. Now my dear friends, let's be persuaded of this first of all this evening, shall we? Are you really persuaded of this? that all the Lord's ways are perfect. Whatever his will may be for your life, are you persuaded that it's perfect? Are you persuaded that he actually knows better than you what's best for your life? Because you see, when we are failing to trust God, that's exactly what we are saying. We are saying, I know better than God. And this is a very fundamental issue. That attitude of trust, of course, is quite basic to seeking guidance, and it's this that takes the element of panic or distress out of situations where we are not sure what the will of God is, isn't it? Thou wilt keep him, says Isaiah in Isaiah 26, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. And it takes the panic out of situations 
where we are not sure what the will of God is. Now linked with that basic principle is the next one which I want to put in this way. A consecration of ourselves to do the will of God must always precede a concern to know it. A consecration of ourselves to do the will of God must always precede a concern to know it. You know how we react when someone says to us, will you do something for me? And most of us will reply, it depends what it is. And we are hedging ourselves about, you see, with a very proper protection. We are saying, well, now I'm not sure that what you are going to ask me to do is supreme wisdom for you or for me. I don't know whether I'm even able to do it. And we are very right in making these qualifications because none of us is infallible in our judgment about things like that. We make a qualified commitment, in other words. But what I want to say to you this evening is this, that you cannot make a qualified commitment to the will of God. Never, ever. Because as you make a qualified commitment to the will of God, you are slandering God's character, do you see? When I say, yes, Lord, I will do this and this and this, but that is probably out of the question. You are actually slandering God's character by saying that he will not know best what is best for us. And that may be another reason that guidance is a big problem to many of us. Lord, teach me thy ways, provided they don't lead here or there or there. Look at what the psalmist says in verse 9. He leads the humble, says the RSV, I couldn't quite remember what the NIV said as Keith read it so helpfully to us this evening, but the authorized version has um, a better translation, I think. The meek, the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek he will teach his way. Now that word for meek is really very interesting. It sometimes is used in various derived forms of the condition of an animal which needs to be broken in order to be led. You will know the kind of thing. There are animals which haven't yet been broken and they cannot be led because they still have a stubborn will. May I let you into a secret during our holidays, one of uh, our many very energetic preoccupations was that we went riding, uh, my family and I, in case you are disturbed, my wife did not come with us, but uh, the children and I went, and uh, I had never done it before. And the lady said to me, would you like a nice, safe, quiet horse that uh, will just stand still? Or would you like a lively one that will go forward a bit and never ready to be done? I said, well, I'd rather have the lively one. And uh, I saw this horse coming, snorting and uh, <laughs> so on. As it happened, when I got onto it for some reason that have, has uh, various not very complimentary interpretations in my family, the horse stood still and wouldn't move an inch. But there were some of them, you see, that hadn't been broken and they couldn't be led and weren't really useful. And you have to do this with an animal. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 32, verse 9, 
be not like the horse or mule without understanding which must be curbed with bitten bridle else it will not keep with you. There is a tendency you see in the animal that needs to be broken. Now it's a very interesting thing to me that this word meek has these connections apparently that it speaks of the animal which is broken in order that it may be led. And what the psalmist is certainly speaking about here is that there is a primary necessity before we will ever understand the will of God that that stubborn self-will within us that wants my way, that pride which rears its ugly head up in the very face of God will be ready to be broken in order that I may be able to be led. You know the sort of thing that the psalmist is speaking about. And it's so real, my dear friends, it's so real. The great problem of guidance for many people is just the problem of an, of an uncrucified self that has never been laid at the feet of Jesus. And this is what the psalmist is speaking about. A disposition to do the will of God must always precede a desire to know it. You see, we need to take Christ's yoke and put it on our neck in the parallel that he used and gladly be under it before we ask in which direction he is going to lead us. You do not say, Lord Jesus, where will you lead me? And he says, here, and I say, thank you, I like that place, or I like that job, or I like that situation. I will put my net gladly under your yoke. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Take, learn. Now that leads me to the third principle and it's this this psalm exhibits a certain spirit within the psalmist in which he seeks God's guidance and his will and you will notice it is taking us some time to come to the idea of the method by which God leads us but these are the prior things and the more important things the psalm exhibits a spirit then within which He seeks God's guidance and his will. And I want just to draw your attention to one or two of these areas. It is, first of all, a prayerful spirit. For so much of this psalm is just the outpourings of a man's heart as he cries to God to show him, teach him, lead him, guide him in the right way. And the whole spirit of the psalm is of a man who is pouring out his spirit to God in heartfelt, real prayer. He is not reciting something. The man's soul is being poured out to God. He really beseeches God for his will and his purpose for his life. That should be both a general and a special attitude. General in the daily walk we have with God in the world and special in particular situations that we face as we have decisions to make and choices to come to. A praying spirit then is the primary thing. Secondly, a persevering or patient spirit. Look at verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I wait all the day long. Now the psalmist is ready to wait upon God. And while waiting on God in scripture implies prayer and various other things too, it cannot be divorced from the question of time and patience and perseverance and a willingness to come before God and wait for his will. Hudson Taylor once wrote to a young missionary, one of our greatest dangers at certain times is to take a precipitate action or make a rash and wrong judgment just because we have not been patient enough to wait upon God. And then this, we must not only submit our wills to God's will, 
we must also submit them to his timetable. Now that's a very significant thing and an immensely important truth. We are to submit our wills to God's will. We are to submit our wills to God's timetable. And sometimes God keeps his children waiting. But he never does so merely for the sake of waiting. It is always because it is better for us to wait than not to. It is always because he has something better for us at the end of that period than he would have had without it. A praying spirit, a persevering spirit, and a penitent spirit, if you look at verses 7 and 8, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to thy steadfast love. Remember me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. And verse 11, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Now what that implies for our purpose is that the psalmist recognized his proneness to go wrong. He had learned to suspect his own heart and his own motives from past experience how easily he might rationalize things to suit himself. And so in verse 11 he cries to God to rid his soul of everything that would blind him to God's ways and deafen him to God's voice. We need to be conscious of that too and to apply that principle in all our thinking about seeking the will of God. Now it's only at this point, as it seems to me, that we are ready to deal with the question with which we normally begin, and that is the methods by which God guides us, or the manner in which God reveals his will to his people. What is it that the psalmist is here basically asking for? Well, if you look at the psalm, you will see that the answer is he is basically asking for instruction, for a deeper acquaintance with God's paths and ways, for teaching in God's truth. Look, for example, at verses 4 and 5. You get this twice-repeated cry, Teach me thy paths, teach me and lead me in thy truth. And basically, this is what the psalm is psalmist is seeking. He is seeking instruction in God's ways, understanding of God's will. And basically this is how God does guide us. He instructs us in his ways, enables us to think through situations with the mind of Christ, and gives us wise and godly judgment about them. In verse 9, the authorized version, the meek will he guide in judgment. Therefore, says the psalmist, he instructs sinners in the way. Now, it seems to me that this is where most mistakes are made in our whole approach to the subject of guidance. Our greatest error, probably, is in associating in a fundamental kind of way seeking the will of God with feelings in a way that is really divorced from scripture so that the natural way to express the fact that you have been led into something is to say I felt led now these two words are almost conjoined together in our vocabulary I felt led to do this. And when people are seeking guidance and to know the will of God in some particular situation, very often what we want is some kind of inner hunch or some voice whispering to us or some kind of 
word given to us through a random opening of scripture in various ways and I don't want to be negative but in various ways people do tend to associate finding the will of God with this sort of realm the hearing of voices the Lord said to me people say now I don't for a moment want to decry that but what I always want to ask people is how did the Lord say that to you how did the Lord tell you about that I want to know how he spoke to you because this seems to be an important issue God you see is a rational God and he has made us his rational creatures and he therefore generally guides us now, I'm not suggesting that there may not be extraordinary exceptions to this rule but he generally guides us by enabling us to assess situations with godly judgment in the light of the general teaching of Holy Scripture and if I am not sure then it is wisdom to seek the godly judgment of someone who is better instructed in the scriptures than I am who knows me well and who is seeking to live the same kind of Christian life as I am seeking to live so God says in Psalm 32 at verse 8 I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go I will counsel you with my eye upon you be not like a horse or a mule without understanding now that's the point when you are seeking the will of God do not be like the animals who are irrational God has made you a rational creature and he normally guides us through our rational processes and when his people wander from his ways and out of his will God cries to them as he does in Deuteronomy 32 all oh, that they were wise all that they would consider and John Wesley says God generally guides me by presenting reasons to my mind for acting in a certain way now that is not to minimize the ministry of the Holy Spirit in guiding us through inward prompting overwhelming sense of conviction or whatever but if you will allow me to quote Dr. Packer to you and even if you won't I'll still do it the true way he says to honor the Holy Spirit as our guide is to honor the Holy Scripture through which he guides us now that puts it in a nutshell doesn't it the true way to honor the Holy Spirit as our guide is to honor the Holy Scripture through which he guides us I emphasize this because I have known Christian people undoubtedly devoted Christian people who have been driven by the most irrational inner urges into all sorts of tragic situations and into some which have had a mixture of tragedy and comedy if they were not so sad let me read to you some words of Dr. Packer in that book I was commending this morning which I have in the pulpit this evening knowing God and I hope that you are in the process of getting it if you haven't already and reading it if you haven't done so he quotes from a book I have not seen uh, written by that shrewd and commonsensical Quaker lady Hannah Whittall Smith and uh, she writes in a book called Group Movements of the Past and Experiments in Guiding of a woman who each morning having consecrated to the day to the Lord as soon as she woke would then ask him whether she was to get up or not and would not stir till the voice now that voice you see was the voice that spoke to her all the time she lived in terms of Christian guidance by this voice 
and she wouldn't stir until the voice told her to dress. As she put on each article, she asked the Lord whether she was to put it on, and very often the Lord would tell her to put on the right shoe and leave off the other. Sometimes she was to put on both stockings and no shoes, and sometimes both shoes and no stockings. It was the same with everything. Then there was the invalid, who, when her hostess visiting her left money by accident on the dressing table, had an overwhelming impression that the Lord wanted her to take that money in order to illustrate the truth of the text, all things are yours. And he goes on to all kinds of different examples of the same sort of thing. But they are not all ancient, you see. Many of them are modern. I knew a student who studied in Dundee and who was seeking the will of God in this kind of spirit and used to be taken out of his bed in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning as the inward voice said to him, down into the center of Dundee. And down into the center of Dundee he would go and stand there in the square and there was nobody there and came back again, got back to his bed that believed he had done the will of God. Now you see, it is a vital thing for us, beloved, to grasp that God is a rational God. He has made us his rational creatures and he guides us through our rational processes. That is not to say that God will not sometimes lead you to do things that defy worldly wisdom. But it does mean that he will counsel you through your thinking enlightened by Holy Scripture. This is the spiritual understanding of which the Apostle Paul speaks in Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10. From that day, he says, when we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking, now listen to how the Apostle Paul asks for them concerning the will of God asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding to lead a life worthy of the Lord. Now, how is that spiritual wisdom and understanding to be obtained? Let me quote to you from John Newton, and some of you have heard me quote this before but it bears repetition. He has a remarkable letter, and I really should be getting some royalties from the Banner of Truth Trust for the number of times I've commended this book to people. The letters of John Newton, there's an excellent letter on the subject of divine guidance. And he says, in general, God guides and directs his people by affording them in answer to prayer the light of his Holy Spirit which enables them to understand and love the scriptures. The word of God is not to be used as a lottery, nor is it designed to instruct us by shreds and scraps which detached from their proper places of no determinate import, but it is to furnish us with just principles, right apprehensions, to regulate our judgments and affections, and thereby to influence and direct our conduct. They who study the scripture in an humble dependence upon divine teaching are convinced of their own weakness and are taught to make a true estimate of everything around them, discover the nature and duties of their several situations in life, and the word of God dwells richly in them as a preservative from error, a light to their feet. By treasuring up the doctrines, precepts, promises, examples and exhortations of scripture in their minds and daily comparing themselves with the rule by which they walk, they grow into an habitual frame of spiritual wisdom and acquire a gracious taste which enables them to judge of right and wrong with a degree of readiness and certainty as a musical ear judges of sound and they are seldom mistaken. Now in some situations when we are seeking God's will in that sense there is little or no difficulty. 
Scripture gives us the clearest possible instructions. You will never find, for example, God guiding you to marry someone who is not a believer or to go off with someone who is already married. Although I have actually had Christians come to me who have claimed the guidance of the Holy Spirit for both of these things. But you will never find God guiding you into that kind of area of disobedience because in these areas where God has clearly manifested his will, it is not guidance we need but obedience. But other areas are not quite so straightforward because you will never find an area of scripture for example commanding you about which job you should choose or which university you should apply for if you have had the nice kind of envelope dropping through your letterbox during the course of this week or which particular partner you should marry or whether you should move home or whatever but this is where Newton's wise words about a life and mind steeped in the word of God producing a discernment about right and wrong which is as accurate as a musical ear judging sound applies. When someone who is, as Newton says, schooled and taught in Holy Scripture, applies himself to this kind of situation, that is to a situation for which there is no immediate biblical commandment, then he begins to discern exercising biblical godly judgment where the will of God lies. And Newton says he is seldom wrong. Because you see a musical ear is trained to discern between harmony and cacophony. If you don't have a musical ear, you'll find that difficult. But a musically trained ear will immediately discern where there is something that is cacophonous, jarring. And someone who is schooled by the Spirit of God in the Word of God has that faculty, the epistle to the Hebrews puts it this way, having your faculties trained to discern between good and evil between the will of God and what is not and the man or woman who is schooled in God's word and counsel learns to judge of situation with the same accuracy look at verse 14 of uh, Psalm 25 the friendship of the Lord or as one of the translations puts it the confidences of the Lord are for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant now some time ago in another connection altogether I was speaking about guidance and had been saying almost the whole time something along these lines about the necessity for us approaching it as rational creatures. And there was a young lady who said afterwards, very interestingly, that was a real man's view of guidance. And I thought, now that's very interesting. That was a very thoughtful comment but of course she was quite wrong because you see what is vital in coming to understand the will of God is not one's gender but one's spiritual discernment and understanding recognizing that female intuition is an important thing and thank God for it that's one of the blessings of marriage but female intuition will not help you if you're not schooled in Holy Scripture indeed it may lead you profoundly up the creek if you can be led up the creek profoundly <laughs> but it will my dear friends it will 
And it's such an important thing for us to grasp this. You may think it's an important thing to give rein to female intuition. I think that's a very important thing too. I don't think you stereotype the way that God guides his children. But I think the vital quality that is necessary is to be schooled in the word of God, submitted to the will of God, and led by the Spirit of God. It's important to add, as Professor John Murray wisely points out um, in the first volume of his collected writings, our dependence on an infallible word and our reliance on an infallible spirit do not eliminate all error in judgment or worry in decision on our part. We are always fallible, imperfect, and sinful. Then he adds this. But it is better to limp in the right way than to run in the wrong way. Now that leads me finally to say a word, and I think it may be an important one, to some of us who may feel that we have got out of the will of God and I say this before we finish. Because there are many people who recognize that they have drifted out of the will of God or actually walked right out of the will of God. It may be this evening that the Spirit of God is wanting to bring us to the place where we will want one thing and one thing only for the whole of our lives and that is God's whole perfect, full, glorious 